term to moderating. What did you hear? What did you find interesting? And what would you like to know more about? Um, Mama Rainey, I think it, the coolest thing to me was that she basically I wrote the first lesbian anthem. So by being able to literally blatantly say, like, I, I'm with a group of my friends and they must be women because I don't like no men. <laughs> you know, I can imagine how, like, right, right. Uh, you know, I'm imagining how, how women at that time, going through that, had felt the first time they heard that. Empowerment, just straight up empowerment. In instant, like, you know, like chills up and down your body, like, wait a minute, there's someone out there that's expressing this? I mean, even if you, some have a question if there's anyone like that out there other than themselves, because everyone's hiding at that point. And then to hear it in such a bold way, like, through your speakers, is like, it's, it's uncanny. And the record company was on board. Because if you look at the ad, yeah, it, it looked it like, like it was clear. You know, exactly. Which is really cool. They knew the market. They knew the market. Yeah. Well, they chose to, to go for that market. That's what's crazy. And to give it such great quality. It's like, wow, the time. Right. Yeah. It shows it to do that. Mm -hmm. um, for her to be the leading artist for like the first decade of the 20th century. True. Ooh, she was on some shit back then. Wait, I can't pass on. No, you can just do it. Do as you want. We talk okay. about sexuality, girl. <laughs> so, so, um, yeah, for her to do that, I found that really interesting. Um, but I did find I did find that that very interesting that she was like the biggest artist that you know kind of broke in the gospel of blues that had more so to do with the everyday like world. Well, she really pioneered it. Uh -huh. Blues was. You know, during the period that she was that she was performing most active, like the, t the first two decades of the 20th century, the blues was just like coming into formation and coming into some sort of consciousness. Mm -hmm. She was really the spearhead of that. Right. You know, Ma, Ma Rainey is, is, is a figure that I'm, I'm less familiar with only because, as you said, you remind me of like the records were recorded with a high fidelity, with the same kind of fidelity that the Fessies were recorded. So we don't have much. Um, you know, I've read stories in other spaces about Ma Rainey's. Uh, overwhelming success <clears throat> and it's awesome that she was on tour and just commanding these sell out crowds of audiences of people black and white audiences who were just eager to see and hear her express the blues um, and there's something to be said for uh, a woman who can gain national recognition as a, a pioneer who's breaking down these barriers but someone who's kind of responsible for bringing us something mm -hmm. and to look at my rating and say here's the first one in the 20th century doing popular music, doing African-American uh, based music, doing the blues. It's just, it says a lot. Right. It just well, says she, a lot. She opened the doors for rock, she opened the doors for disco, mm -hmm. therefore you open the doors for hip hop. So yeah. like, for her to be the first person to step into that round, it's really cool. And she was very much, she was very much of the people, as with, as with mm -hmm. Betty right. Smith. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking earlier about strong strain of, um, of religion in the African-American community and how much of the ideology it controls. And it's the same thing with middle class morality, you know, which of course was patterned after white culture at the time. And both those populations did not listen to the blues, they did not like the blues, they considered the blues to be dirty or devil's music, you know. But the people, you know, and I think that's part of the reason that the realness of black life yeah. came through the blues, including alternative sexuality. Right. It's like they just didn't get it, they just didn't give it at it. Right, because right. their audience did, you know. Yeah, yeah, their audience wanted some honesty mm -hmm. and truth that was being withheld. And that was, you know, the, the that poem that was quoted in, in the film came out of the Harlem Renaissance. So it was written by Sterling Brown. Yeah. And it was like simple. She just, she just gets a hold of it some kind of way. One of the things that I really noticed, and I really, um, for instance, that the, the segment that talked about Ma Rainey hosting the party and then getting locked up, you know. And you mentioned it, Khalil mentioned it as well, about how you can have people who know that certain people were out and certain people don't. Right. So here you are, you have this person that, while she has a husband, yeah. people know yeah. her sexual orientation, I, yeah. and she even has another artist come to bail her out of prison. Right, that's and true, I forget about the best was there. That's very that's interesting to me. Yeah. And in terms of like how I see it in today's culture, I mean, 
we look at these celebrities now, and we see these artists who are out there, but do you feel like there's that same camaraderie and community amongst, amongst artists? Or, because there's still taboos, there's still that kind of, those gates that are up there. But is there still that community that you feel like maybe later on we're gonna find out more and deeper things about people? As far as like finding out something new, I think the only time we find something new is when the artist has passed nowadays. Uh, we got TMZ, we have uh, Facebook and social media constantly uh, you know, updating us. Sometimes it's not even true, you know. I don't know how many times I've seen Wayne die. We talk about Cardi B, everybody knows who the father of her child is, that they just broke up. You usually find out the day of. So yeah, there is room for it, but a lot is pretty much out there and exposed. I'm always afraid of exceptionalism. I'm afraid to like, you know, yeah. we praise these people, but we forget like one, they may have had the money. Bessie, Bessie went around on tour and she had a caboose that she owned. She would hook that up to the train line when she was going on tour. She had wealth. That story of her bailing out Ma Rainey, like, okay, you have wealth and prestige, which is great. Don't get me wrong, that's amazing. But we know the bail system is broke in America right now. We know if you don't have that kind of money access to lawyers right now, how are you gonna navigate that? So I think there's, there's a fear I have about exceptionalism that we, for, that we forget that, oh yeah, these are folks who we can admire the work they're doing, but at the same time, understand like the money they had access to. Not everyone in our community has that. So we may need to like build uh, solidarity networks and depend on each other a lot more. The, the same way Bessie was helping out Ma at that point in time. Chris Albertson, in his biography of Bessie Smith, recounts a cast party that landed Ma Rainey in jail. It seemed that Ma had found herself in an embarrassing tangle with the Chicago police. She and a group of young ladies had been drinking and were making so much noise that a neighbor summoned the police. Unfortunately for Ma and her girls, the law arrived just as the impromptu party got intimate. There was pandemonium as everyone madly scrambled for her clothes and ran out the back door. Ma, clutching someone else's dress, was the last to exit, but a nasty fall down a staircase foiled her escape. Accusing her of running an indecent party, the police threw her in jail, and Bessie bailed her out the following morning. From out of the South in the early years of the 20th century, up from the Delta. The juke joints, the plantations, running north along the river and railroad came the blues. From the mists of field hollers, work songs, bent notes, and twisted lives, a music was created that described a world that was black and poor, rough and tumble, loud and sexy, achingly rooted and constantly on the move. This music, born around campfires, in sharecropper cabins, at Saturday night parties and Sunday picnics, moved from the circle of friends and neighbors to small bar stages and vaudeville shows. In the 1920s, the new record industry liberated this music from live performance. And the money that African Americans spent to hear Crazy blues and downhearted blues created the first class of black divas in history. I'm a lone boy weaver, get out of great long time. I'm gonna say these blues, so he's a boy weaver. The blues queens of the 1920s comprised the first recognizable group of working class Americans to sing their way to fame and fortune. 
They were independent women, free of domestic shackles, large in lifestyle and lavish in costume. While they often sang of cheating men in low times, their success hinged in no small part on a presence that was sexually suggestive with lots of flash. Black divas were expected to deviate from feminine ideals held up by the rest of society, faithful wife, devoted mother, and deviate they did. What you looking around for? Who gonna see you? And so what if they do? They got to prove it on you, baby. <laughs> when we think of the term race music, you know, and how it was used all the way up through the 50s and 60s, it's suggested, and even within the black community, um, these were blues singers, so we know that they were shunned by the church and the like. So essentially, they could get away with, they were an alternative culture, even among their own culture, even in their culture, where the predominant music and expression was in the church. So they had, they were alienated twice over, and so they had an ability, a free space built in. Ma Rainey, born in Georgia in 1886, started to perform publicly in the early 1900s as part of a vaudeville troupe called the Rabbit Foot Minstrels. Christened Mother of the Blues, Ma Rainey developed and popularized this musical form throughout the first decades of the 20th century. When blues recordings proved to be a financial bonanza for fledgling record companies, Ma Rainey recorded almost 100 songs between 1924 and 1928 for Paramount Records. Though married to Pa Rainey, a fellow vaudevillian with whom she toured in an act called Assassinators of the Blues, Ma Rainey was bisexual. In 1928, Ma Rainey wrote and recorded a glorious, if ultimately ambiguous, anthem to women-loving women. The ad for the song in the Chicago Defender did nothing to allay their readers' artfully aroused suspicions. When I was last night with a crowd of my friends, there must be women, cause I don't like no men. It's true, I wear color and a tie. Makes the wind blow all the while. But the say I do it. Ain't nobody called me. They still got to prove it on me. But none of this was public knowledge. To her fans in the South and along the Mississippi River Valley, Ma Rainey sang their lives and sorrows their love and laughter, their backwater blues. As Sterling Brown wrote in his magnificent ode to her. I talk to a fella and the fella say, she just catch hold of us some kind of way. She sang backwater blues one day. And I went and stood up on some high old lonesome yeah. And I Naturally bowed their heads and cried, bowed their heavy heads, shut their mouths up tight and cried, and Ma left the stage and followed some of the folks outside. There wasn't much more the fella say, she just gets hold of us that away. I always thought I was so revolutionary coming out, and then you hear Ma Rainey saying, I went out last night with some of my friends. Must have been women's, cause I don't like no man's. Come on, this was not popular stuff to be singing back then or stuff that they even talked about. Will I have 
When Ma Rainey comes to town, folks from any place miles around, from Cape Girada, Poplar Bluff, flocks in to hear Ma do her stuff, comes flivering in or riding mules or packed in trains, picnicking fools. That's what it's like for miles on down to New Orleans Delta and Mobile Town. When Ma hits, anywhere is around. Harlem Renaissance poet Sterling Brown wrote this praise poem to the first of the early blues divas during the depths of the Great Depression. She was a great performer and she made people love themselves. She made people accept who they are. How can we deny that? She was the Nicki Minaj, the Queen Latifah, the Ella Fitzgerald of her day. And she almost disappeared from history. When she died of a heart attack in 1939, her hometown newspaper listed her occupation as domestic worker. Times have changed, but our film, Taint Nobody's Business, Queer Blues Divas of the 1920s, is still the only documentary that presents Ma Rainey and Bessie Smith and Ethel Waters as bisexual and lesbian trailblazers. We hope you've enjoyed this recap of Taint Nobody's Business that celebrates Ma Rainey, mother of the blues. For further information about these early blues divas or about the Queer Holland Renaissance in general, feel free to click on the link below or on screen.